Good afternoon, everybody. Good evening. My name is Sandro Galeo, and I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. On behalf of our school, welcome to today's Bicknell Lecture. The Bicknell Lecture is one of the highlights of our academic year. It was endowed by Dr. Bill Bicknell to provide, a quote, a periodic but regular infusion of iconoclasts and original thinkers who will bring ideas to students and faculty that stretch, upset, stimulate, and leave, the, leave us with renewed energy and commitment to make a real difference in the lives of the underserved. Today's conversation reflects the founding spirit of this lecture. We are here to discuss something contemporary, controversial, and deeply significant for health. Travel restrictions have been at the center of our policy debate for several years now. COVID brought travel restrictions to the policy forefront. During the Trump administration, we saw a debate rage about the morality of travel restrictions, imbued as they were then with xenophobic rhetoric, even as there were questions about whether they could limit the global spread of the pandemic. Originally, WHO guidelines were against travel restrictions, although they changed over time. We have since come mostly to accept some travel restrictions as emergency measures, even as we have remained uneasy about their use. So it has actually been quite a confusing picture. Ultimately, the conversation about travel restrictions should include both the science of disease transmission and the ethics and trade-offs involved in this issue. The Bicknell Lecture is the perfect setting for such a conversation. Thank you to everybody for joining us for this conversation. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Sharmila Devi is a writer and editor with more than 25 years experience working for international agencies, newspapers, and consultancies. She was a correspondent in the Middle East and Africa, including more than five years as the Jerusalem correspondent for the Financial Times during the Second Intifada, and has reported developments in politics, economics, global health, and climate change all over the world. She's also worked in New York as a correspondent for the UAE-based national newspaper, and in Iraqi Kurdistan as a correspondent for the English language service of the local media network Rudal during the conflict with ISIS. She writes and edits major reports for NGOs such as UNICEF and, and for political risk consultancies about politics and global health, as well as a contributor to the World Report pages of The Lancet, writing about global health issues, conflict, and humanitarian crises. Directly relevant to today's conversation, Sharmila covered COVID-19's impact on the world, including how travel restrictions hampered the global response to the pandemic. We are very pleased to have Sharmila Devi with us today. Thank you for joining us. Sharmila, now over to you, who will introduce our panelists and lead today's discussion. Thank you, Dean Galea, and to all of our panelists who've made the time to share their insights on this very complicated and very timely topic. First, we will hear from Sandra Crosby, MD. Sandra Crosby is a medical doctor and professor of medicine at Boston University, specializing in internal medicine. She's also a faculty member of the Hull Floor Bioethics and Human Rights Department at the Boston University School of Public Health. Dr. Crosby is, no, is notice, notable sorry, for being one of the first doctors allowed to travel to Guantanamo to independently examine Guantanamo captives. Then we will turn to Professor Eskild Peterson. Professor Peterson is Professor Emerit Emeritus of Infectious Diseases at the Institute for Clinical Medicine, Faculty of Health Science at Aarhus University, Denmark. He chairs the Emerging Infections Task Force in Basel, Switzerland. Professor Peterson is internationally renowned for his extensive contributions to global health, therapeutic drug monitoring, multi-drug resistant infections, implant associated infections, travel medicine and emerging infections. Thirdly, we will hear from Samantha van der Slot. Samantha van der Slot is a university research lecturer at the Oxford Vaccine Group at the University of Oxford, working on health, society, and policy topics. Her current projects are about policies for neglected tropical diseases, outbreak response, a history of typhoid fever, and attitudes to vaccines. She draws on perspectives from sociology, anthropology, history, global health, and science and technology studies. And then we'll turn to Professor Barbara von Tigerstrom. Professor von Tigerstrom is a professor at the University of Saskatchewan College of Law, where she has been a member of faculty since 2005. She holds a law degree from the University of Toronto and a PhD in law from the University of Cambridge. Dr. von Tigerstrom's main areas of teaching and research are health law and policy, information and privacy law, and tort law. Her work in public health examines domestic and international legal issues relating to both infectious and non-communicable diseases. I may have got the order for some of you mixed up there, I think, but first of all, I know for sure we're going to turn to Dr. Sondry Crosby. Uh, please, Dr. Crosby, the floor is yours. <laughs> 
Good day, everyone. Since the beginning of the pandemic, the US government has blocked and expelled asylum seekers at the US Southwest border, utilizing the public health provision of Title 42 of the US Code. And we'll go on to the next slide. Little known section 361 of the Public Health Service Act grants the Secretary of Health and Human Services broad authority to prevent the introduction, transmission, or spread of communicable diseases from foreign countries into the US when the CDC director believes there is a serious danger of a communicable disease entering the country. However, the statutory language does not provide discretion to the government to exclude individuals unless there is credible risk to spread disease. The origins of Title 42 held back to the 1893 Quarantine Act, the spirit of which was to screen and quarantine, for example, to prevent the spread of cholera from ships arriving from Europe. The US government has used the COVID-19 pandemic as a rationale for invoking Title 42 to block and expel asylum seekers attempting to enter the US through the Southwest border. The use of the Trump-Biden Title 42 policy is unethical, illegal, racist, and harms vulnerable populations. It undermines a public's trust in public health by speciously using public health as a politicized immigration tool. The use of Title 42 violates the fundamental rights of asylum seekers not to be returned to danger, refoulement, and to have a fair opportunity to adjudicate their asylum claims and seek protections from persecution. These rights are established in both domestic and international law. Using Title 42 as justification, the majority of migrants seeking asylum at the US Southwest border are promptly expelled to their home countries or to third countries where they may face persecution, murder, torture, and other human rights violations. Next slide, please. Um, and as you can see here at the beginning of the pandemic um, in light blue, almost all of people presenting to the US Southwest border were expelled. Um, more recently under the Biden administration, more people are being processed. However, the majority of people are still being expelled. Title 42 policy targets Haitians, Central Americans and Africans who are seeking asylum at the US Southwest border. The policy doesn't apply to other groups of border crosses, crossers including those coming over for commerce, education, and the millions that are arriving by air travel. There is no evidence that asylum seekers are more likely to spread disease than other groups of travelers and linking marginalized populations with disease is discriminatory and xenophobic. Impact and harm. Since the beginning of the pandemic, more than 2 million expulsions have occurred, including over a million times in fiscal year 2021 alone. As you can see, and let's, can we get the next slide, please? We are at an all time high of apprehensions at the border. And having the, this policy in place has not deterred border crossings. The reason for this is the push factors driving forced displacement have not been addressed or mitigated. Things such as violence, poverty, discrimination, sexual and gender-based violence, and conditions related to climate change such as famine and floods. There's an increase in repeated attempts to cross the border driven by unsafe and inhuman conditions on the Mexican border side to which to, in towns to which people are being expelled. Although the Biden administration has exempted unaccompanied children from expulsion, over 14,000 children have been expelled under this policy. This causes harm. Can you go to the next slide, please? So what happens when people are expelled? A number of NGOs have been tracking this. Since Biden took office, Human Rights First has tracked over 8,700 reports of kidnappings, torture, rape, and other violent attacks on asylum seekers who have been blocked or expelled. 
non-Mexican asylum seekers have been forcibly returned to countries of persecution, including Guatemala and Honduras. In September, 2021 alone, the Department of Homeland Security expelled over 6,000 Guatemalans despite significant ongoing human rights abuses, including extrajudicial killings, generalized violence targeting persons with disabilities, indigenous groups, and LGBT, LGBTQ persons, and forced labor, including child labor, among other abuses. Since September 2021, the Department of Homeland Security has expelled over 14,000 Haitian asylum seekers, including children, despite the political strife and deteriorating humanitarian conditions in Haiti. Even the US State Department has noted Haiti is experiencing widespread kidnappings and violent crimes, including arbitrary killings and excessive use of force by the police and corruption, and even warns its US citizens not to travel to Haiti. Title 42 expulsions have fueled violence in Mexican border towns Asylum seekers who have been forced into ad hoc encampments without protection are exploited by cartels and organized criminal gangs for kidnapping, rape, torture, and extortion. Asylum seekers are suffering from direct mistreatment and abuse by US border, border patrols. There are some you may recall iconic images of Custom and Border Patrol agents tear gassing women and toddlers and chasing Haitians on horseback with reins looking like whips. And if we can go on to the next two slides to look at those. Okay. NGOs have documented verbal and physical abuse in human detention conditions, withholding of medical care and active deception about the expulsion and whereabouts of family members, just to give a few examples. There have been a record number of deaths on the border during attempted crossings in 2021, with at least 650 reported as of December. Okay, next slide. For, Title 42 has resulted in continuing separation of families. And when some family members are expelled and others allowed to apply for protection, forcing agonizing situations and decisions for families. In December alone, it is reported that 16 pregnant Haitian women were separated from their partners. Multiple human rights investigations have documented the physical and psychological toll of asylum seekers who have been expelled. These include things such as post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, anxiety, physical injuries, and severe psychological harm to children. So what is being done? There have been many who have called to end this policy. There are currently multiple legal challenges to Title 42 ongoing within the United States, including the ACLU, the ACLU of Texas, Oxfam America, RACES, and other organizations. Letters from thousands of public health experts to the Biden administration in July and October 2021 reiterated that the latest scientific knowledge regarding transmission of the virus that causes COVID-19 does not support expulsion as a public health measure. In fact, it is the opposite. Holding migrants in crowded detention centers prior to flying them across borders actually creates increased risk of COVID-19 transmission. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees and the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights have taken the extraordinary, extraordinary measure of appealing to the US to end this policy. Most recently, last week, more than 100 Democratic members of Congress urged Biden to address the disparate and often inhumane treatment of black migrants, urging him to order a review and to recommit to reversing anti-Black immigration policies in the US. Application of Title 42, can we go on to the next, next slide? It, application of Title 42 as a travel restriction to asylum seekers at the Southwest border denies access to full and equal asylum proceedings with due process 
violates the principles of non refoulement and causes severe harm to asylum seekers. It is a violation of domestic and international law, and there is no evidence that it has slowed the spread of COVID-19 into the US. Title 42 is a perversion of science and betrays the public's trust in public health. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Cosby. Um, that was an amazing overview of some of the things that have been happening over the last couple of years. And as you say, very little evidence on the strict narrow definition of containing disease, very little evidence that they have worked, which I'm sure this will be one of the things people may well want to debate a little later on. Um, I believe now that we will turn to Professor Barbara von Tigerstrom. Thank you. Yes, and I'm reflecting as I was listening to Dr. Crosby that uh, most of my attention in the next few minutes at least will be focused more on more difficult questions of assessing legality or complying uh, compliance. So uh, there are certainly, uh, unfortunately, is no shortage of examples of what I think we could quite easily identify as uh, clear violations, but many more uh, examples also of uh, matters that uh, test the boundaries uh, and, and force us to ask difficult questions about what might be justified. Uh, and so uh, my attention, I've tried to draw together some thoughts about the, um, the role of the international legal framework and especially the international health regulations uh, as revised in 2005 as the main instrument. Um, in uh, guiding decision making uh, about, especially in, in difficult cases where we have to determine what measures are, are justified. And so they all, all of the questions I've been asking myself revolve around a version of a question I repeatedly ask about the law in public health, which is what kind of framework and principles uh, are most useful in guiding decision making in conditions of uncertainty and especially this uh, the last few years have been a cardinal example of where we have you know in some cases almost no evidence to guide decisions initially or very little uh, um, rapidly changing evidence uh, and emerging evidence and, and making having to make decisions under those conditions of, of uncertainty uh, what kinds of principles or frameworks could we use to guide uh, decision making and for the moment, at least, I'll assume that those decision makers will be attempting in good faith uh, to make uh, the best decisions possible under those conditions. Uh, and so just to give a very brief overview of the international health regulations, I think we've all through the course of the last two years become quite familiar with at least some key points, but um, the, uh, their objective is to balance the protection and prevention of the spread of disease uh, against uh, avoiding unnecessary interference with international traffic, so international travel of human beings and uh, international trade. So not avoiding or minimizing all interference, but avoiding unnecessary interference that doesn't actually contribute to um, the um, prevention or protection. Uh, and so with that in mind, it has really four different types of provisions to guide decisions about uh, travel. I'll focus just on travel restrictions. That will give us plenty. There are, of course, trade issues as well. Um, but focusing on travel, there are specific provisions on measures that can or can't be taken regardless of an emergency, just in the ordinary course of, of international uh, traffic uh, measures that can be applied. Uh, by member states of the WHO, uh, then when we are, as we have been for some time now in an emergency situation, the potential for uh, specific temporary recommendations to be made, uh, formulated by the emergent expert emergency committee and then formally issued by the WHO director general, which of course in can include many things, but may include guidance of or recommendations about travel restrictions. Uh, and then uh, also the possibility for member states to take uh, additional measures, regardless of whether they're recommended, that would achieve uh, a, the same or a greater level of protection as that which would be achieved through the temporary recommendations, 
um, so long as those measures are no more restrictive than reasonably available alternatives that would achieve that level of protection they've uh, determined, uh, and to base a commitment to base those measures on scientific principles, evidence, and information, including but not limited to from the WHO itself and WHO uh, advice. And then specific uh, commitments for those additional measures to um, uh, report uh, and provide a rationale for those to the WHO uh, and to review them no less often than every three months. Importantly also, and again bearing in mind uh, the presentation we've just heard, the, the um, regulations specifically incorporate respect for human rights and compliance with other international uh, agreements as part of what's required to justify uh, any measures taken under the regulations. And so essentially incorporate by reference all of international human rights law. So one of the questions uh, that I've been asking myself, and I'm sure others have been as well, is in terms of the structure of the regulations, they're set up in such a way that um, adhering to recommendations isn't contrary to what we saw in some of the early discussion uh, at the beginning of the pan this pandemic. Um, it, the compliance or conformity with WHO recommendations isn't the be all and end all of legality under the regulations, but they are set up as a default. That as long as you follow those, um, they are uh, assumed to be acting legally. And uh, if you do not follow or if you exceed the recommended measures, uh, those have to be justified according to the principles that I've just stated. And so one question is how that uh, framework or structure, how useful that has been uh, in guiding decision making. And I have, um, for better or worse, concluded, and I, and I expect I'm not alone, not that the answer is not very, <laughs> that um, the best or most uh, sensible measure of whether a state has acted legally or legitimately, which may or may not be the same thing in, during the pandemic and travel restrictions, um, it, does not in, at the end uh, have much to do with whether they have followed WHO recommendations, strictly speaking. Certainly we saw in the early stages of the pandemic, very wide divergence between recommended measures and what was actually happening on the ground. And I'm not saying that that doesn't give rise to cause for concern. Uh, there are a number of reasons for it, of course. But by their nature, I think what we've seen in since then is that um, the, the very nature of having a single set of recommended measures that could apply equally to all member states with very different situations on the ground, very different epidemiological profiles at a given moment in time, uh, very different uh, capacities, both in terms of uh, enacting other public health measures effectively and capacity in the healthcare system to manage uh, outbreaks of disease, um, that it's, it's quite uh, unrealistic to think that a single set of recommendations could be formulated in a way that would be appropriate for the default period of three months uh, for all member states uh, in the world. Um, and so, uh, of course, there is the potential for other WHO guidance um, and some of that does appear to have had more effect, um, but there again, uh, to be sufficiently detailed and context sensitive, those uh, take time to produce uh, and will, it would be difficult to do that in a timely way, again, in a context where the evidence may be shifting quite so, uh, so quickly as it has been. And so uh, what else do we have to guide decisions or to, after the fact or at the moment, measure our perception of restrictions that are put in place uh, and whether or not they're legitimate or legal? Uh, the other uh, provisions have, I think, served us fairly well with a few exceptions. Uh, if I were to pick a single article in the regulations that has been most uh, clearly and widely violated, it is probably Article 40 that says member states should not charge travelers for uh, certain public health measures that they impose, uh, including testing and quarantine. Um, and we know that that has not be compl been complied with. And I think we could all accept the underlying 
motivation or premise of this that travelers uh, and migrants should not bear the cost of public health measures. Uh, and yet, uh, I find myself asking why, for example, a small island state where the measure might actually pre-departure testing might be imposed, why that state should bear the cost of uh, a fairly wealthy traveler returning to their home country and needing a pre-departure test, uh, why they could not, uh, the traveler should not bear the cost of that. And so we may need to revisit whether the wording of this article is actually capturing uh, the motivation. Um, <clears throat> I think we have, as I mentioned already, uh, seen a number of examples where uh, almost everyone has been able to quite quickly identify violations of some of those core principles of proportionality or what is the no more restrictive than needed to achieve the level of protection of uh, measures that lack of rational scientific basis. Uh, and some issues with transparency and, and leaving measures in place without timely review for a longer period than can be justified. Uh, and so, um, but the fact that we can identify those violations and have a fair amount of consensus on that, to my mind, is actually quite useful. It means that those principles are serving us well, uh, that what is needed is more steps in terms of uh, encouraging pr and promoting compliance. That, of course, is, is a very difficult matter. Um, so finally, I just uh, in, uh, in applying those principles, I want to highlight a, a few points uh, where their application has been uh, quite challenging and perhaps in some ways, different ways than we might have expected. So in applying a principle like what is the least restrictive measure or no more restrictive than needed to achieve a certain level of protection, um, that we have seen and tried to apply principles like that to a very a dizzying or mind boggling array of different types of measures and ways in which they've been implemented. Uh, and so some people, there's a good piece by Kelly Lee and colleagues that sets out a typology uh, that I've found quite useful and others I'm sure have done similar work trying to make sense of this variation. Uh, but even things as simple as determining what is a less restrictive measure, is it always more restrictive to have a legally binding prohibition or could so-called soft measures like advisories actually have the same or in some senses even greater impact? What is the human impact on the ground of these measures may depend not so much or not all, certainly only on what's on paper, but for example, the support that is provided to effective persons. And again, there's been some really good work on that. And we have to take into account in assessing each measure in isolation that they're not happening in isolation, that we have a cumulative impact. One good example of uh, how the details of implementation and the design of measures can be really important and requires careful attention. Um, uh, it struck me as the distinction between uh, the measures taken, and I'll use my own country of Canada as an example, in response to the emergence of the Delta variant uh, earlier and then more recently Omicron. Um, it, and with Delta, Canada put in place a flight ban that took the form of what's called a notice to airmen that effectively prohibited pilots from doing direct flights from India or Pakistan to Canada, all direct flights. Uh, and uh, whereas more recently with Omicron, they took the more typical approach of enacting an order in council under the quarantine legislation and emergency uh, order. Um, that prohibited uh, those who had traveled uh, or been in certain countries within a certain period of time from entering Canada if they were foreign nationals. Now, both are controversial for very good reasons, but those two methods of implementation raise issues of transparency. It was actually not easy to find the text of that notice that banned flights to, uh, from India to Canada. Uh, and would not have been easy for the average person to find the exact terms of, of what was happening. It's a blanket measure that provides for no uh, distinctions based on the reason for which people were traveling, their country of nationality, despite 
the right enshrined in international law to re-enter one or to return to one's own country. Uh, and um, was left in place partly perhaps because of the lack of transparency for a very long time, for, for months after it, its justification had evaporated. Uh, and so that's just one example that I'll, I'll end with of how paying attention to the, the specifics of uh, the way restrictions are implemented can really make a difference uh, and has to be uh, given some attention when we're doing the assessment. Thank you. Thank you, Professor von Tegerstrom. Um, as you say, the international health regulations, uh, people who'd never heard of them before are suddenly a little bit more acquainted with them. And I think they're going to be the subject of debate, a lot of debate at the next World Health Assembly in, in May. But uh, now we'll turn to Professor Eskild Peterson, please. So it's important to realize that uh, border closures and the travel restrictions are a knee-jerk reaction when you have something new like we had with uh, COVID here. Suddenly something came up in Wuhan in China and uh, because we have experience from previous outbreaks that uh, box travel with people, there was a uh, reaction in the government and it's the government who have the responsibility because they are accountable to the electorate uh, we we better close the borders and the previous experience we uh, we had was sars cov one that spread from uh, hong kong uh, to, uh, to toronto and we had the uh, uh, new delhi metalloprosate beta lactamase from india to the uk so can we stop imported infections there has been two major strategies during COVID, and that has been elimination, uh, primarily in New Zealand, China, Australia, where they sealed borders even to their own uh, citizens, and then uh, mitigation, which is risk reduction, which uh, has been the main strategy in, uh, in Europe. And I'm going to discuss these two major uh, concepts uh, throughout my, my presentation. Next uh, slide, please. Yeah, this is uh, just a uh, from the uh, SARS-CoV-1 outbreak in 2003, where the infection very early in the outbreak spread from uh, Hong Kong to, to Toronto, and there was quite a, a challenge to the healthcare system in uh, to, Toronto. SARS-CoV-2 had a different dynamic, so uh, after about six months, the uh, the uh, pandemic never took off. It actually fizzled out. But this is a typical spread of um, of a travel related early in an outbreak. The uh, <clears throat> metalloprotease, the New Delhi um, uh, multi-resistant uh, bacteria, is a different matter because uh, it's usually transmitted by asymptomatic people being carriers. Next one. So early in the COVID pandemic, we can see we are here already on the 1st of February, the U United States closed down uh, entry to foreigners traveling from mainland, mainland China and imposed quarantine to uh, American citizens. Um, afterwards, we know that it was too late. The infection was already in, uh, in the, the, the US, especially in California. So because it has been circulating for at least uh, six to eight weeks in China. And of course, there's been a lot of traffic uh, before the 1st of February between China and the uh, US. Next one. So this is just a little review of uh, different uh, travel restrictions imposed uh, in uh, the EU. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, you can see that it, it varied quite a lot. And uh, <clears throat> that demonstrates that uh, despite what is the recommendation by the WHO, it's the national governments who has the responsibility to decide what do we do within our borders. And even within the EU, it varied quite a lot. Next. Oh, previous. One thing is um, <clears throat> uh, aircraft, uh, uh, but land borders is a real challenge. And you can see here, you have a 40 kilometer queue of lorries uh, entering from Germany into Poland in uh, March uh, 2020, because there was uh, travel restrictions. This really uh, has a deep economic impact. And if you are 
carrying food. It, it's also a matter of the food supplies and so on. So land borders are a huge problem. Next one. Just a single slide on uh, thermal screening at airports. Uh, I think we have all tried that to uh, have our temperature taken by some kind of thermal camera. But there was a study here from the London School of Hygiene saying that even in the best of situation, it, it picks up two thirds. But uh, if you have, uh, especially with the Omicron, where you can have uh, infection without having fever, it is really uh, not effective. Next one. So the strategies before and after introduction of vaccines, I think the, the vaccines are very important because pre, before we had the vaccines, we had the classical public health tools of isolation, tracing of quarantine. I, I, my, my personal uh, feeling is that elimination is an impossible strategy because we have a zoonotic virus where you have uh, animal uh, reservoirs. We just had an outbreak in uh, hamsters in, uh, in Hong Kong. We have uh, infected white bears in the United States. And in Denmark, we experienced a huge outbreak in, uh, in our mink population, which were culled, all of them. So borders cannot remain hermetically closed forever, especially if you exclude your own uh, citizens. So the aim of an elimination strategy must be to buy time to achieve a high vaccine coverage. So how much is um, to buy time? The mitigation strategy, which were what we did in uh, Europe, aimed at flattening the curve. That means that you will have the same number of infections, but you will spread it over a longer time. So the burden on the healthcare system will be lower. One of the main reasons we choose that in Europe was an experience from Northern Italy in uh, February, March 2020, where the system was quite overwhelmed by a very high number of uh, hospital admissions. So <clears throat> it reduces the trans border transmission, but it does not eliminate it. And uh, the point is that if you have um, widespread transmission in your own country, does it really matter if you get a few more cases over the borders? I don't think so. Keep the burden on healthcare manageable so you get time to roll out your vaccines. Next one. There was a paper here from uh, our colleague uh, Michael Baker from uh, New Zealand where he uh, discussed the elimination strategy versus the mitigation strategy. Of course, vaccines was not mentioned, even though this uh, paper came out in, uh, in uh, December 2020, where the vaccines were started to be uh, in introduced. So you can see here, return to carefully manage new normal within two to three months. And now New Zealand started to lift the restrictions after two years. So clearly the uh, elimination strategy really closed borders for a very, very long time. Next one. And you can see this is a, <clears throat> a slide I received from, uh, from Michael Baker showing the uh, people who crossed the New Zealand borders. And uh, you can see they were very, very effective in closing the border. So there was almost no one entering New Zealand uh, for in 2020 and 21. Next one. <clears throat> So <clears throat> what did New Zealand achieve? Well, you can see on the left graph here, we compare the mortality in Denmark. And as you probably know, we lifted all restrictions of first of February. So we have a mortality of 80 per million population, whereas New Zealand achieved a almost zero mortality. But if you look at the right side, uh, you can see that our vaccine coverage, and I choose to get the, uh, the booster dose, is higher in Denmark than it was in New Zealand. So it appears to me that they didn't really use the time of the total uh, uh, elimination uh, strategy to uh, improve the uh, vaccine co coverage. <clears throat> so mitigation versus elimination, the Chinese experience. Next one. So you can see here, this is a report from, uh, from uh, CNN from the 21st of January showing that China is building huge quarantine facilities. And the idea is that 
people who is crossing the border need to be isolated. Um, and of course, if you are isolated in a quarantine facility, your risk of getting COVID will be higher than out in the community. Next one. So basically, China is uh, sticking to the uh, to the um, elimination strategy. They they had a plan. It seems here to um, to roll out vaccination, but uh, as you can see, it's uh, it's not really uh, possible for them just with the vaccination and. Uh, <clears throat> It should be realized that the Chinese vaccine is a whole cell inactivated vaccine and China do not use mRNA vaccine or adenovirus or backbone vaccines. Next one. There's a very interesting uh, study here from uh, colleagues in the Middle East comparing uh, vaccine rates in Bahrain and uh, Qatar, and you can see that they are almost having the same proportion of the of the uh, population vaccinated. But if you look at the right side, it's the number of uh, new cases per per million, and you can see Bahrain is really having a high number, and Qatar has a low number. So what's the difference between Qatar and the Bahrain? Well, in Bahrain they uh, use the Chinese wholesale inactivated vaccine. Where whereas uh, Qatar used the uh, Pfizer-BioNTech uh, uh, mRNA vaccine. So it seems that these two countries are very comparable, socioeconomic status and so on. There's a huge difference. And the main reason for that difference are most probably the, the different vaccines. Next one. So this is uh, uh, South China Morning Post, which is my favorite source of news from, from China. And uh, <clears throat> there's quite a, a panic right now be, because they have uh, more than um, uh, 200,000, 34,466,000 cases on a daily basis in uh, Hong Kong. And Hong Kong is now uh, a part of China and can you, and the, the discussion is, do we have to have a new lockdown? And if you <clears throat> move to the lower piece, which was from uh, this morning, you can see there's a, a run on the supermarkets and pharmacies because people are really scared of having a lockdown, which will be a consequence of uh, the elimination strategy. Next one. So my question is, if uh, elimination is the only option op open to China and indeed Hong Kong, if the national vaccine do not provide any effective protection. So I will leave it there uh, and go to the next slide. So then came Omicron, and this is a um, <clears throat> from the Deutsche Welle, the uh, national German broadcast on the 26th of November. And uh, you can see here that the European Union states agreed to suspend travel from Southern Africa. But what we should realize is that on the 26th of November, we already had imported cases. And I think the first cases was registered in Southern Africa uh, by the 6th of November. So we already had it widespread in Europe by, by that time. So the point is that um, travel restrictions often come too late. And uh, the, we should really uh, give our compliments to our colleagues in uh, South Africa who notified us on an early basis, but it was too late for travel restrictions to really pay, play a big difference. Next one. <clears throat> So there's a, a, a study here from December where they uh, studied in the, the UK uh, of the Delta variant. They, uh, they looked at uh, uh, isolates that have been sequenced. And you can see here the transmission chains uh, that later dominated had already been seeded before restrictions were in introduced. So, so they could, based on the analysis of the genetic sequencing, see that there's been several, more than a thousand times, introduction into the, into the UK, despite the travel uh, regulations. Next one. And if you look at the uh, picture in Europe right now, where uh, it's uh, quite widespread, you can argue, I, I, does it give any meaning to have travel restrictions between the uh, European countries? And uh, of course, uh, I, I don't really think so. If you have uh, 
widespread national transmission, it doesn't make any difference if you have border restrictions. Next one. And just to um, <clears throat> come back to the WHO, who along uh, most of the outbreak has really been warning about having a wide uh, uh, <clears throat> ranging uh, travel restrictions, as we also heard that the uh, previous speaker was, uh, was speaking about. But again, it is the national governments who has a responsibility and the national governments are accountable to the electorate. So it, it was the national governments who took the decisions here. Next one. So this is my, my last slide. I, I would say that <clears throat> travel restrictions are needed in the beginning of an outbreak to try to reduce the number of imported cases before firm data on morbidity and mortality are known. And I think that's a, a very important message here that we can speak about evidence base and whatever, but we don't have the data in the first maybe three to six months, we don't really know what was the uh, mortality of COVID. Did, do, did we trust the Chinese data? We need to, uh, to realize that in the beginning of a uh, pandemic like the one we are experiencing right now, we do not have the data. Another important point is that land borders are much more difficult to control than uh, airports and, and seaports. Again, as I've been discussing here, what should we choose? Mitigation or elimination? Elimination may be possible like for islands like Australia and New Zealand, but for Europe, it was not an option. So the European strategy was mitigation. Elimination limited in time and not sustainable in the long term. Vaccines in my view, are the road to open borders and the travelers should be fully open to fully vaccinated and boosted people even without test. And if you are not fully vaccinated, then a negative test should uh, pave the, the way to enter a country is if the country has widespread uh, transmission already, because then it doesn't make any difference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Peterson. There's a lot of fantastic information there that you've uh, summed up for us nicely. Um, and uh, yes, it seems that, you know, as you say, you know, elimination, mitigation, what may work early on in a pandemic isn't necessarily the way, you know, those measures should not necessarily be in place for the full course of a pandemic. So lots to debate there. Um, and now we will turn to uh, Samantha Vanderslot, please. Hey, thank you very much for inviting me. I've enjoyed listening to the speakers so far. I, I'm going to share my screen now. And if you bear with me, I'll also turn off my video during the presentation to help with the connection. Okay. Okay, so um, my talk is taking a bit of a different approach. So I'm going to be looking at a historic example. And I think it's useful to look to the past to try and understand how we've got to our current situation and see what we can learn from another epidemic disease, yellow fever, um, and particularly the associated travel restrictions um, and what we can see there for considerations and consequences with COVID-19. Okay, so there have been many measures in the past that have aimed to halt the international spread of disease. And with my colleague Tatiana Marx, we looked at the case of yellow fever to see what insights could be garnered about one, the, the public health interventions that have evolved in controlling the spread of disease internationally and to the health diplomacy implications of the interaction between global health and international relations. And we put most of this in um, a paper in 2020. So a short background about yellow fever as a historic example. Uh, so yellow fever is an infectious disease. It's caused by a mosquito-borne flavivirus that occurs mainly in South America and Sub-Saharan Africa. It used to be much more widespread um, across the world, and this included parts of North America. Today, yellow fever could potentially spread to countries in Asia and the Caribbean, 
uh, these countries are not currently endemic, but the mosquito, Addis aegypti, and non-human primate hosts are present here. So controlling yellow fever first began with quarantine and then shifted to more coordinated approaches, which today include country vaccine entry requirements. But what we were also interested in were how public health interventions directed at yellow fever have also been very closely intertwined with economic and foreign policy interests. So this frequently led, led to diplomatic tensions, uh, beginning with quarantine. So these quarantine measures of isolating people that may have been exposed to disease uh, largely originated with the Italian city-states in the 15th century. They were soon adopted by other European powers, uh, mostly other international trading powers. Uh, and this adoption was seen at the time as being quite a hostile act um, and often led to tit-for-tat diplomacy. So lessons learned from these interactions meant that countries would later decide there was a need for better international cooperation um, in order to control disease and also harmonize decisions about quarantine. The ways of organizing and agreeing to international cooperation relies on states meeting and signing agreements. Uh, and this was done with the first international sanitary conference in 1851 on plague, yellow fever and cholera. The findings of this conference then culminated eventually in the international health regulations, which have been mentioned already in 1951. And those regulations mean that the World Health Organization can apply them to any disease considered a significant threat to international public health. Yellow fever is currently the only disease for which a proof of vaccination may be required for travellers as a condition of entry. Um, so under the regulations, also states can take additional measures, which uh, Professor von uh, Tigerstrong um, and Professor Peterson has noted. Um, but why yellow fever? Why is this um, the only disease required for travellers as a condition of entry under these regulations? I mean, it may be because um, diseases like cholera and plague, they both have treatments today, while yellow fever doesn't have an effective treatment. And so there's the potential for reintroduction um, of the disease for countries with the host and the vector. So yellow fever poses this significant international health threat uh, with a potential to disrupt um, global trade and travel and still causes up to 60,000 deaths a year. So um, it was then the expansion of air travel and also population mobility that enhanced the speed that infectious diseases could be introduced to new areas. Something that was recognised quite early on was that countries who were subjecting aircrafts to quarantine restrictions, um, which were similar to those being imposed um, previously on ocean going ships, um, again caused tensions with um, those who were seeing such restrictions as being um, a limitation on the development of commercial air travel. And so um, there was also a wide variation um, across countries in the types of quarantines that were imposed on aircrafts and the isolation rules for individuals who arrived from endemic countries, a, a bit similar to what we're, we're seeing now with COVID-19. So by the 1940s, when a yellow fever vaccine became more widely available, um, there was then an additional public health measure that could be used. And the expert commission on quarantine, which was established at the WHO in 1948, uh, produced the global yellow fever risk map, and they made recommendations for permanent measures against arrivals from endemic areas. Today, travellers are advised to have the yellow fever vaccine if they're travelling to countries that are endemic for yellow fever. And some countries have mandatory entry requirements. These vaccine entry requirements either apply to travellers um, or travellers, or particularly travellers arriving from countries with risk of transmission of disease. So the measures are both intended to protect travellers from contracting the disease, but also to prevent travellers introducing the disease to a vulnerable country. 
And I think as COVID-19 is variously controlled across countries, we're likely to see further developments of risk maps and uh, recommendations on the global stage for uh, these sorts of measures going forward, but more in a coordinated approach than is currently happening. At the moment for yellow fever, the most important factor influencing whether a country has vaccine entry requirements recommended by the WHO is the presence or absence of that vector that transmits the virus. However, there are factors that include the capacity of countries to deal with potential outbreaks and also individual country histories play a role here. So these are the sorts of things that can be expected for COVID-19. Um, there are important limitations to note when regarding the, the increased use of vaccine entry requirements, uh, whether it be uh, via countries or via the WHO at some point. Um, despite the more widespread cooperation, restrictions on borders continues to lead to tensions and decisions about whether such me measures are um, not only medical, but also a diplomatic act, which was um, touched upon uh, um, quite strongly in the first presentation by Professor Cosby. So diplomatic incidents, um, although in general had been rarer to 150 years ago, um, there is continued um, potential for tensions um, as we've seen with COVID-19. And a vaccine entry requirement is never just a health measure alone, but needs to balance the interests of several um, different actors. So in the face of new outbreaks, um, we've seen countries revert to quarantine to combat disease. And the COVID-19 pandemic relied, has relied on quarantine or quarantine-like measures, um, including now large-scale travel restrictions, and um, more recently vaccine entry requirements, um, but often with tests and um, other types of measures um, being a part of this. Um, we've seen with the yellow fever vaccine entry requirements that these um, will also entail social, practical and ethical dilemmas. And at the time in, in 2020, looking at the case of yellow fever and thinking about how COVID-19 would develop, we posed three questions, which I think um, are still relevant and can be adapted to the current situation. So the first was about the different efficacy and safety of vaccines, which um, raises questions about differences between vaccines um, being delivered across countries and their recognition across borders. So this does continue to pre present problems. The next was what to do about the variation of burden of disease across countries. Um, we're now seeing, um, particularly in Asia and the Pacific, that did well with blanket bans and quarantines for entry. Um, they're now opening up with vaccine entry requirements. But I think the question still remains whether the more limited impact of um, vaccination on transmission and differing in-country vaccination coverage rates and herd immunity will um, vaccinated country entrants still pose a threat? So um, connected to this, we also pondered whether political motivations uh, will be used for vaccine requirements. I mean, we saw that with the US uh, from certain countries. And lastly, um, a consideration that um, sometimes gets overlooked is whether robust enforcement um, will also be possible. And, um, poor checks and forged documentation for yellow fever has demonstrated how um, this is an ongoing issue, even for well-established vaccine entry programs. So I'd like to end on two po points that we noted about the um, IHR and the WHO that could be considered also in relation to COVID-19. So since the 2005 revision of the IHR, uh, the regulations to use vaccine entry requirements um, have been able to be applied to any event with the potential to be a public health emergency of international concern um, as a legally binding agreement between UN states. Uh, we noted that the WHO, even with this um, addition, has not typically been in favour of travel bans and restrictions, uh, seen it as a disincentive for early outbreak report reporting 
and being disruptive for trade and um, travel with then the associated economic and social impacts. So um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, the WHO have so has sought to achieve this balance between restricting travel and trade uh, with appropriate protections. Um, and this, this really continues to be an inherent part of disease control um, for measures imposed on borders. Okay, so I think I'll end there and thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Van der Slot. That was very, very interesting. Um, and a good reminder, there's very little that happens that's new. <laughs> Things that have often happened and happened before in human history. We'll now turn to the discussion part of this session. Um, and we've heard a, there's been a, there's a lot of food for thought here from our various panelists. Um, I thought I'd like to just throw up, up the general question of whether we have learned anything from the last couple of years of policymakers, health officials. Uh, the chances are that there might well be another pandemic, hopefully not too soon. Um, what, what could be done differently? What should be done differently? And I'd like to start with uh, perhaps Dr. Crosby. Um, uh, you sort of outlined a lot of uh, uh, hard uh, uh, events that happened over the last couple of years. What can we learn from them? Um, yeah, great question. I, you know, I think first of all, we can't confuse public health with immigration policy. Um, which is exactly what we've done with Title 42. And I think our panelists here, and um, you know, we have well-established measures um, now for um, mitigating the spread of, of COVID-19 across borders, but we're still just blanket ex expelling um, asylum seekers without using um, measures such as vaccination, um, social distancing, um, hygiene, um, screening, and then appropriately quarantining if necessary um, and treating people for COVID-19. So I, I think we need to absolutely um, rescind Title 42 and, um, and not use you know, these, these laws um, to, um, for human rights violations, which, which is what we're doing and harming people. Absolutely. Would anyone else like to, to jump in and, and comment? Please, Dr. Peterson. <clears throat> yes, no, I absolutely agree. And um, it's interesting to see uh, in the current situation in Europe with more than 600,000 refugees from Ukraine, none of the European countries have raised any questions about COVID isolation quarantine. That's a very, very interesting point. Um, uh, and it's got there have to be risk factors there. Are so many people gathered in, 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 in small areas. Uh, yes, please. Although I would say there have been reports about um, border crossings being more difficult depending on skin color and um, the origin of those people trying to cross from Ukraine to um, other parts of Europe. And um, I mean, that's almost ref reflecting a de facto um, policy of um, what Professor Crosby has been talking about. And I think um, these instances aren't yet being reported on, but they're um, kind of um, to be expected, unfortunately, because we know um, how different immigrants um, even in-country immigrants across Europe are being treated. Absolutely, yes. Um, it reminds me, uh, some of the, some NGOs have uh, boats that crisscross the Mediterranean, you know, to try and save people. And there've been incidents where boats have just not been given any port or berth. They've been having to go from port to port across the Mediterranean before they can dock. And the excuse being given last summer was, uh, was COVID. So perhaps that's another example. Um, any other lessons that we could maybe learn? Uh, one of the, I think one of the reasons you know, WHO says that it's against uh, uh, blanket travel bans and restrictions is that it can make it very difficult to, 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 for this, the, the, the export of much needed medical equipment, PPE, PPE which was a, 
uh, obviously a very big issue early on in the pandemic. Um, are, are there other reasons that do you think that, you know, perhaps travel bans are not the way to go? I'll maybe use that as a jumping off point for a couple of thoughts related also to what others have just said that um, there are a few different factors to keep in mind that I mean, we can ask whether, again, in isolation, a certain type of measure in a certain context might be justified because of potential public health benefit. But then there are those knock on effects of, you know, if the if the planes aren't flying, then that affects cargo as well as uh, international travelers. And that wasn't always sufficiently taken into account. Um, uh, but also that even if uh, and especially the impact on um, both trade and migration and asylum seeking. We've seen a number of situations in which each country's measure individually may have seemed justified, but the cumulative impact uh, has caused serious problems that I'm not sure we have if we do have legal principles sufficient to deal with them, we don't have a cooperative, uh, you know, useful framework to address them collectively. So problems of collective action and, and the, the problem of denial of port access is a great example of that. That even if we accept that each, uh, you know, of the affected states individually might be able to justify closing its ports to a certain ship, um, if all of them do it, <laughs> you know, eventually we run out of places for them to, to go uh, and end up with a humanitarian crisis. And we've seen versions of that. And so that is something going forward that I think uh, we need to pay some attention to. It's a very difficult challenge. So, um, so I'm, I'm not terribly optimistic, but I think we need to not forget that side of it. Uh Another question, I'll, I'll come on to questions from the public one in a moment, but just one other thing I wanted to ask uh, all of you, uh, whoever would like to jump in, which was how hopeful are you of greater international cooperation? Um, you know, the World Health Assembly will be an obvious place where uh, commitment, uh, people, countries will be able to prove their commitment or not. But I don't know if any of you have any particular thoughts on, do you see any examples of greater uh, international cooperation that, uh, you know, will help ease the situation next time we're in a similar situation. And I, I'll uh, throw it open. Um, I think uh, Dr. Van der Slot, you said uh, you did mention something that there might be more uh, risk maps and coordination may come about at some point. Uh, perhaps you might like to expand on that a little bit. Yeah, I think that that is to be expected. So we'll we'll see what happens at uh, the assembly. Um, I think there are going to be some points of contention about, um, uh, say, for example, the, the last point, um, raising the alarm and um, whether we're going to be penalizing countries who first identify, um, say, a new variant and um, what kind of approach can be taken in order not to um, uh, yeah, single out a country um, because they've, they've um, identified that. So I think um, there, there, there are likely to be very specific um, recommendations for cooperation based on what we've experienced over the last couple of years. Um, Dr. Peterson, in your very interesting presentation where you were talking about uh, elimination versus mitigation, um, are you able to discuss at all about whether countries have changed? Do you think um, some of the countries like Australia, do you think next time around they will pursue a similar strategy? Do you think minds have been changed over <clears throat> the course of this pandemic? Well, I, um, I definitely hope so. I think there's a lot of uh, the pandemic and a lot of how we handle the pandemic that <clears throat> we still have to, to learn. And there will be a lot of papers coming out over the next years about who did uh, better and who did worse. Um, for, for us in Europe, it would be impossible to ban uh, travels uh, into a country by your own citizens. And uh, 
and also <clears throat> in here, I think that in Europe, uh, the UK was the only one who implemented uh, quarantine hotels. Uh, we would do a rapid test in the airport and send people home for, for quarantine, but it would be voluntarily. So there's a lot of things that we have to, to learn. And I think that the countries will pick up from each other which one was doing good and which one was uh, doing bad. So we will learn from each other. But again, it's, impo it's important for me to, to say that, that the responsible party is the national government. And uh, those countries who have been doing well has had a good collaboration between the political level and the professional level. Each one has to respect that. Uh, we as professional have to respect that the government take the decision and the government has to respect that we have some knowledge that they do not have. When that has worked well, the country has been doing well and also have had the, um, what shall I say, understanding in the public. And, and that has been tremendously important, especially when you talk about vaccine rates. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. So uh, we do have a question from uh, our audience. And uh, the question is, how do these restrictions assist or not assist those who have underlying disabilities uh, and or young children, I think that uh, they mean, uh, and young children. So yes, uh, travel restrictions and people with underlying disabilities and or traveling with uh, young children during a, a pandemic, that can obviously be a, uh, IHR, international health regulations, you know, would, would would mean that you know such people do not get caught up uh, even during a pandemic. But uh, obviously, that's probably was not the case during this pandemic. Um, uh, Dr. Von Tigerstrom, perhaps you'd like to uh, comment. Yes, a couple of quick thoughts that. Um... This would be one reason why I think the, the point I made about the attention to the mechanism that's used is really important. That some of the more blunt uh, instruments, like a, a ban on a certain form of transport, doesn't allow us to make uh, distinctions or exceptions for people whose circumstances uh, may not uh, you know, make a certain measure like vaccination, uh, for example, suitable where there is a genuine medical exemption, there should be some way of making exceptions. Uh, and that may or may not be possible depending on the mechanism that's used to restrict travel. So that would be uh, one. And then uh, the other you know, fundamental point is that one of the core principles of the IHR is that all of the, all measures should be non-discriminatory implemented in a way that does, is not discriminatory. And then in some cases, that means applying the same measure to everyone does discriminate because it affects them disproportionately. Would anyone else like to, to add anything to that? Okay. We have another question. Uh, this might be a little too specific, um, but uh, do countries such as Scotland and England require a third dose of COVID vaccine in order to travel? Uh, is this changing? Uh, um, I think that would be something to look at the uh, the England and Scotland uh, health travel pages. I think that's something uh, that might be a little difficult to get into right now. Um, uh, to get back to the international health regulations, I mean, or rather, Let's step back a little bit. I mean, this last week, we've had an extraordinary week with this, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and so many things have been upended and changed. I mean, Fortress Europe, as it had been called, uh, has thrown open its doors to, to Ukrainians. I mean, so many things are changing so quickly, um, which goes to show that, you know, when there's political will, things can happen. Uh, could this um, political will, I mean, could this sort of translate into, uh, into, in, into greater, into health issues? Um, I mean, there are people that are already saying that, you know, climate, obviously climate is another issue, but, you know, this, this concerted political will, it is possible to, to galvanize that. Um, let me ask each and every one of you in turn, on your wish list, list of, uh, uh, of health measures that you'd like to see um, governments around the world take, and specifically relating to our topic this evening, you know, 
what could you do if you had that political will? What, what measures would you like to see introduced? And let's start with uh, Professor Peterson. Well, I think that um, <clears throat> we have to realize that uh, it's perhaps not as dangerous as we thought in the beginning of 2020. Um, the Danish government abolished all the restrictions uh, the 1st of February, and we had a peak, but uh, the number of uh, ICU admissions were very low. So the, there must be some proportionality to the danger. And uh, comparing to yellow fever, don't forget that yellow fever has a mortality rate of uh, 50% where COVID-19 uh, has a mortality rate of uh, maybe 1% or 1.5. So there's a huge difference here. Another difference is that if you have one shot of the yellow fever vaccine, it protects you for the rest of your life. But we have an issue with the durability of the protection after the COVID vaccine. So it's different situations. But I, I think that giving a um, <clears throat> disease that's perhaps are not having a very high mortality and then you come do a complete uh, lockdown or closure elimination like they did in New Zealand is overshooting uh, really. Uh, we, we are used to in Denmark when we have seasonal flus that we have an excess mortality of about 1,500 a year uh, in, in a seasonal outbreak <clears throat> and we are 5.8 million people. And, and we are not never thinking of closing down society because we have a seasonal flu outbreak. So we have to say, okay, we can, we can live with this one. And whether we get uh, a few cases more or less over the border doesn't make a huge difference. Well, maybe we'll see when we get the next variant in the autumn, what will happen. But, but I think that, that we, we have to look how dangerous is this really. Is it really, are we doing too much here? Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Crosby, what would be on your wish list if you could use, could harness that political will to, to rewrite <laughs> international health regulations? That's a, that's a great question. Um, I really think, you know, going back, we need to think about, um, enforcing principles of non-discrimination, because I think that's really been illustrated throughout this pandemic on um, discrimination, especially against black and brown people. Um, and how can we uphold everybody's human rights during a pandemic? Um, you know, it's not just asylum seekers at the US Southwest border. We've seen increases um, in cases of violence against women, deaths and abuse in prisons, female cutting, child marriages, there are all kinds of things um, that have happened during the pandemic. And going back, um, you know, how can we build, build in protections for when the next, um, you know, variant comes out in the fall and, and make sure we, we can at least mitigate some of these harms to all people and uphold everyone's human rights. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Van der Slot, please uh, tell us your wish list. Uh, so my wish list would be um, for the political will um, to not have um, amnesia over every few months with this pandemic, because it does appear, I think we are in a completely different situation with vaccines. Um, the threat of variants is still there. Uh, the, the threat of um, uh, bad outbreaks in lower income and middle income countries, that's still very much there, which are hugely under vaccinated and um, we're ignoring a massive threat um, uh, for the current pandemic by not thinking about these these other countries and um, not only our own um, and it's just um, yeah been a surprise every wave uh, that we seem to forget especially the politicians and what just happened and a toleration for death and long COVID and continued problems. Um, also disruption that is caused through having um, outbreaks reoccur. Um, uh, yeah, I would like to see some uh, more long-term um, perspectives on, on the pandemic and um, not just looking at the situation we are in at the moment when cases are, are lowering in a lot of countries, but um, might not continue that way. Thank you. And uh, Professor von Tigerstrom, please, let's hear your thoughts. 
Well, it's tempting going last to just say I agree with what everyone else said, and I do <laughs> wholeheartedly. Um, but a couple of other points, I think, I mean, and some of it draws attention to one of my main worries or wishes is that, you know, what needs attention most are the things that are most difficult. Um, that addressing those underlying disparities that then translate into disparate impacts, that is the most important and yet also the most difficult. And where we see at the moment very little, you know, relatively speaking, very little political will. Uh, and so looking at some of the discussions that are taking place now, there's, uh, of course, the um, discussions at the World Health Assembly of both past and future and the discussion of a new pandemic treaty, which seems to be, you know, very much on many people's minds. I do worry, I, I'm not saying that there's no value to those discussions and maybe to a new international instrument, although I'm somewhat skeptical uh, on that, but I do worry that some of that will simply become a distraction from the real work that's most important, which is under, under you know, addressing some of these underlying issues. Thank you. And then my final question to each of you before we wrap up, um, so we just have a few moments left, um, would be, do you think that some of the measures that governments introduced, specifically the, the travel bans, the travel measures, travel restrictions, would they, do you think that they really did uh, have an effect? Did they, were they more about trying to give their citizens a sense of security? Did that sense of security was that if, if any citizens had a sense of security from such restrictions, were those, uh, was that sense of security misplaced and perhaps that might have meant they were less careful in their interactions? Um, just your final thoughts on that before we, we, we wrap up and uh, perhaps start with uh, Dr. Crosby. Oh, I think you're on mute, Dr. Crosby. Yeah, well, you know, in my comments on the way the US has used Title 42 as a travel restriction measure, um, I, I don't even think there was a pretense. Um, I, I think it was used as an immigration policy um, that had nothing to do with public health. Um, so 50% of the people or whatever percent of our population that don't like immigration, um, I'm, I'm sure we're very happy about it. Um, I do not think, uh, according to all of the experts, all of the public health experts, um, that this policy has done anything to make, um, to prevent the spread of COVID into the United States. So I, I think it was, it, it was false, falsely, falsely used. Thank you, Dr. Crosby. And uh, this feed up, a similar questions just come up to the question I just put to you all, which was uh, the somebody has asked, based upon what the panelists are saying, uh, is that there is some travel restriction, are some travel restrictions biased and can they be harmful, harmful to the country and the people involved? And I think that's very much what you were just saying, Dr. Crosby. Um, perhaps we could turn to Dr. Professor Peterson. <laughs> No, I absolutely agree. I mentioned three examples in my talk, and the first one was the uh, the U.S. that imposed travel bans uh, on a very restrictive uh, case definition like visits to Wuhan, and there was no doubt that there was already transmission in the U.S. at that time. Uh, then we had the uh, Omicron variant coming into Europe, and uh, we also had transmission before the travel ban the 26th of uh, November, uh, because it had been circulating for at least four to six weeks in South Africa. And then there was the, the paper I took up with the introduction of the Delta variant in the UK, also showing there was multiple introductions despite travel variant, travel restriction. So I think that, that and I hope that is, one thing that we will all be informed in the coming years by studies saying what was effective and what was not effective. But it's clear to me that once you have uh, widespread national transmission, travel restrictions or severe travel restrictions doesn't make sense. You can say, okay, 
you can enter if you have a negative test within 72 hours or you have two vaccines. And we all know that a negative test is not absolutely sure and two vaccine shots may not really uh, protect you, but it reduces the overall risk. But it should be kept simple like that. Uh, and, and, um, and, and I think that is what I think, I, I think we should really learn from, uh, from, from this is that we have been doing a lot of restrictions and really what did we get out of it. Thank you. Um, Professor von Tiefenstrang. Yeah, I think, again, we can just go back to the same basic set of questions. Is there, you know, a rational scientific basis on which to, to think based on the evidence we have that this could have some beneficial effect? And for some of our measures, I think the answer is no. <laughs> and we can see that quite clearly. Uh, if there's some, according to the evidence, some potential for a beneficial effect, is that worth it? Is it worth, it, it, does it justify the negative impacts that it could have? Uh, and again, we could draw a separate set of conclusions once we pace, pass the basic rationality test. Some we could still dismiss as being disproportionately harmful, either in general or to certain groups. Uh, and so again, I could give the same and, and more examples of both. And I, um, I, I think it's very important to realize that in the beginning, you, you have no scientific basis. When the Omicron came up, nobody knew really whether it was more dangerous or less dangerous. Within the first two or three weeks, we got data out of South Africa, but the European countries were, was waiting and say, okay, but maybe they have a different age structure. Maybe some had had asymptomatic infections that wasn't registered. So it looks like it's milder, but we're not really sure. So the there is a, a, a phase in an outbreak or in a changing situation where you have no data. So you cannot say that you need scientific evidence. The scientific evidence, unfortunately, comes afterwards. Luckily, it turned out that Omicron was less dangerous and a third uh, shot really gave you a good protection against serious illness. But that was something we learned over the next two or three months. And uh, the next version this autumn may be more dangerous or less dangerous, nobody knows. Thank you. And Dr. Van der Slot, your final thoughts? Yeah, so I'd, I'd probably mirror a lot of what the others have said, but I, I would say that we can see that the stronger travel restrictions did work. Um, that's why countries use them. Um, but of course, very can be very damaging in other ways and unsustainable. I think if we have better options to use, we want to use them. And something that countries are wrestling with is um, uh, what vaccination means within uh, the travel restriction space, which I think uh, is still uh, something that's being decided. Um, we also have to remember that um, it's very difficult to isolate policy measures to determine individual impact. So um, in parallel, other things are happening, other, other health measures other than travel restrictions, other events, other um, situations and activities. So um, yeah, to, to actually um, make a point about travel restrictions, we do have to keep in mind that there are other things going on at the same time. Thank you very much. Well, we've come to the end of our conversation. It's been really interesting. You've all raised some extremely important points, which let's hope uh, uh, listen to. Um, but thank you very, very much for your time and your participation and also to our audience and our audience questions. And I now return the floor back to Dean Galea. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Shermila. And thank you so much for Drs. Peterson, Crosby, Van Tigerstrom, and Van der Slot. It's really what a really interesting conversation. I, I, I'll echo Ms. Devi in saying that uh, it was, a, I think it was a conversation that uh, that really had the complexity, nuance, and sophistication that the topic deserves. I think it's a really difficult topic. And it emerged from all your comments that uh, fundamentally issues like travel restrictions are issues of trade-offs and they're trade-offs that have political, social, economic, and infectious disease implications. And, and they are to my mind, it has been consistently something that we have struggled with during this pandemic, admitting that we're dealing with issues um, that have trade-offs involved. And I thought in all your comments that emerged so clearly, and I feel like the world would be so, so much better served if we had these kind of conversations throughout the past two years. And hopefully this is what the moment is doing. The moment is, is giving us an opportunity to learn uh, 
from what we've been through in the past two years so that hopefully we can do better in the future. I echo, I can't remember one of you said this, uh, that you're looking forward to the data that is going to emerge um, after the past couple of years. And I agree with that completely. And I really think that nothing fundamentally redeems the tragedy of 6 million people dead from COVID. But if we do not learn from the moment, then we are really deepening the tragedy. And it really is on us to have these kind of conversations and to learn from the moment. So I'm really grateful to all of you for helping us learn today. I'm really grateful to all of you for the points you made and, the, and showing us how the science and the ethics intersect and of course intersect with the politics in a way that is perhaps uniquely challenging around this issue of travel restrictions. Thank you for uh, being with us. And I want to say thank you to the audience for uh, participating in this conversation as always. Everybody have a good afternoon. Have a good evening. Take good care. Thank you.